All right, hello everyone, and welcome to uh, this week's episode of Backyard Nature with Mr. Sam. Today we are talking about pollinators, but first off, happy Earth Day to everybody, everybody watching, everybody around the world. Um, 50th anniversary, that's amazing. Um, Earth Day is wonderful, and I always love the Earth. Um, Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about pollinators, which... I was hoping today would be a good day to talk about pollinators, but it's cold um, and windy and our little insect friends don't like it when it's cold and when it's windy. So we won't see any today, but we'll still talk about them. Hello, Miss Jen and Mr. Jace, and hello to my sister, Emma. All right, so we are gonna spend most of today inside of my greenhouse. So let me just show you here. This is my greenhouse. It's small and cute and you can walk inside. Um, And I got it for my birthday right before I moved out. Um, But yeah, so outside it's pretty cold today. It's in like the 30s right now. But let's check what the temperature inside is. Hello, Lindsay. temperature right now in here is about just below 70. It's about 67. So nice in here. All right, just give me a moment to get myself set up. And then we can get going. show you around really quick so I originally got this greenhouse because I'm growing lemon trees and a coffee plant and I was like lemon trees and coffee plants would be good like it would be good to have a greenhouse to grow those in Um, so I put them in here and almost all of them died it turns out that uh, the lemon trees and coffee trees are actually shade loving plants and they don't like it to be too hot. They like it to be just around 70 degrees. So the greenhouse was just too much for them. So now um, we just use it as a place to put, uh, to pot our plants and grow our plants and stuff, which is what I'll be doing while I'm talking today. Oh, hi, Nikki. It's nice to see you. Or to see that you're watching. Hello, Allegra and Sarah. It's already getting warm here. All right, so like I said earlier, today we are talking about pollinators. And pollinators are animals, because it's more than just insects, that help plants reproduce from carrying pollen from the male flower to the female flower. And that's what allows them to make their seeds or fruit like apples. And they're so important because so many plants depend on them to survive. And so many plants that are important to us, too, like our fruits and vegetables. Um, So we love pollinators, and we'd like to help them. Um, So for... I want to give you an example of two different pollinators. Uh, Well, actually, I'll give you more. So there's... there's, Everyone knows the bees. Um, Everyone knows the butterflies. But also... Um, mosquitoes can be pollinators. I know people don't really tend to like mosquitoes, but they do help. They're not as efficient, but they do help. Um, hummingbirds, they're, uh, as they get close to drink that nectar, um, they pick up pollen as well, which is beneficial, and they bring it on to the next flower. Um, even bats can be pollinators because they're, they're so cute. They're, they're small, and they're fuzzy, and the pollen gets on them, and oh, I love it. But, um, so... I want to talk specifically about bees because everybody, like the staple poster child for pollinators is the honeybee. And uh, the honeybee is nice, but is actually not native to Connecticut. They came from Europe. Um, So it's nice that they give us honey, but they're actually not the most efficient pollinators, especially for our area here. Um, One of the most efficient pollinators for our area is the mason bee. And the mason bee looks very similar to a honeybee, but they're smaller and they're fuzzier. They're so cute. I love them. Um, 
and the the fuzziness, the fur on them, helps them to collect all that pollen and move on to the next plant. And they're actually going for the pollen. They want the pollen. The, the honeybees want the nectar, and they're kind of picking up the pollen as a side thing, and they pack it onto their legs so it doesn't fall off. But the, the mason bees just scatter it all over them like leftover cracker crumbs from your meals and, uh, and then bring it on to the next plant. And this is actually very interesting. A mason bee, it takes 10 mason bees to pollinate a whole apple tree while it takes 1,000 honeybees to pollinate the same apple tree, the same whole big apple tree, which is wild. Mason bees are awesome. And to top it off, they're not aggressive. They don't have a hive, they live in holes, so they have nothing to protect, uh, so they don't sting you. In fact, the males don't even have stingers. So they're friendly, they're awesome, they're cute. I love them. Um, yeah. So, why are pollinators so important? I mentioned it earlier, they, have, uh, they, they help to produce our fruits and vegetables. Um, so, we love them for that. I mean, like, they're very important for farming. And it's to the point now where we're actually losing a lot of our pollinators and humans are actually coming in and they're taking paintbrushes and painting the, the they're using a paintbrush to pollinate, to transfer the pollen from the male flower to the female flower, which is wild. I, like, it sounds like it would get boring over time, but. So only honeybees make honey. Um, to my knowledge, yes, but I'm not exactly sure about that. But I mean, that's what they're known for, is making honey. Um, that is a good question. In fact, I will probably look that up later when I'm done, and then I'll leave you a response on that comment later. Um, thank you for that. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, so I know a lot of people are afraid, are not afraid of pollen, but like people have allergies. Um, and the pollen that is on bees, the plants that create pollen that needs to be transferred from animals, you don't have to worry about that kind of pollen for your allergies. For example, um, goldenrod, which everyone thinks is ragweed, and ragweed is scary for people with seasonal allergies. Um, goldenrod is not the same as ragweed. They rely on animal pollination, so seeing that around won't, shouldn't cause your, um, your allergies to act up. Which is uh, which is good, especially because that is a it is a beautiful plant that sh shows up in late summer. Um, so there's air pollination, um, like the conifer trees do that. Have you ever seen um, just the plumes of pollen spores falling off of pollen or uh, off of um, pine trees? It's cool to watch unless you have seasonal allergies. <laughs> Um, and then there's the animals, which is like what we mentioned, which is the honeybees and the mason bees and the butterflies and stuff. And then there's also another form, which is rhizomal, or rhizome, um, which is basically the, the plant grows roots that go down. So if here's the soil, the roots go sh 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 and then just grow up over here. And plants like cattails do that, um, beech trees do that. And it's very cool because it allows them to be very successful at taking over uh, places very localized. And also in the case of the beech tree, um, a mother beech tree can share resources with her children, share sugars and information. It's a beautiful relationship, I love it. Um, yeah, yeah. So, now you're probably asking, Mr. Sam, how can we help these pollinators? Because they're so awesome and I, now I want to help them. And I love that you want to help them, very good. Um, the answer is you can plant plants that they like to pollinate. Um, I would encourage you to look for native species to Connecticut when, when you want to um, plant plants. And that's because uh, the insects that live in Connecticut are more well adapted to um, living with and working with plants that have been here for millions of years and they've evolved with them. So for an example, this isn't a flower, but an oak tree can have, uh, it has about 300 species that depend on it for survival. 300 species, which is wild. Um, and so if I take, if I'm in my backyard and I'm like, I want to either plant an oak tree or a Japanese red maple, 
the oak tree is going to benefit those 300 species that live in my backyard. The Japanese red maple might help like maybe 10, and it'll look pretty to me, but ecologically and in, in, in the environment, it's not going to help um, the species. And we want to help our species that live here because especially the insects, they are the base of the food chain, the food web, and all these other species like the beautiful birds that we love depend on these uh, insects because starting right in the next few months as things start to get warmer and we start to see baby chicks, or not chicks, sorry I'm thinking of chickens all the time, as we start to, see, uh, to hear and see baby birds, um, the, those birds depend on the larval insects like caterpillars. Um, to to feed their young. They're high in nutrients. For humans too, but Americans don't like to eat them. <laughs> um, and speaking of caterpillars, certain species that you can plant, um, like for example, this is a package of milkweed. Uh, it's not necessarily their... Um, the, the benefit of the milkweed is not that it's providing pollen or nectar or stuff, uh, although it does. Um, the benefit of the milkweed is that this is the only plant ever around that a monarch butterfly can, um, like the caterpillar can eat. So if there's no milkweeds, no monarch uh, butterflies, as simple as that. Um, so I'll plug the pollinator pathway, it's this very cool project. It's just this, um, this program where we're trying to get basically a chain of plants that are pollinator plants and milkweed so that these insects and these butterflies have a pathway that they can follow when they're flying and, and migrating because monarch butterflies do mi uh, migrate. It's very cool. Um, so we want to give them a pathway home. So if ever, the more people that plant mono or that plant milkweed, the better. Um, they do have these beautiful purple flowers. Um, around the fall, they can be kind of ugly, but I mean, they're so important. To me, they're never ugly. I love them. Let's see, we got another question. Is that why they're endangered, or did I make up that monarchs are endangered? Uh, they, I'm not sure if they're actually officially endangered. Um, perhaps Jen can remind me on that, but they, their population is um, being threatened because of the lack of um, the lack of milkweed and also pesticides and things like that, yes. Um, also, random fun fact, they're poisonous. Don't eat them. Um, they have a toxin in them that it wouldn't kill you, but um, for like blue jays that like to eat butterflies, um, if you ever see a blue jay eat a butterfly, he'll eat it, and then a little while later, he'll start to like shake his head and stuff, and then he'll throw up. It doesn't kill the blue jay either, but it definitely uh, reminds the blue jay to not eat the monarch butterfly. A lot of times in nature, bright colors means, um, especially in insects, bright colors means that they're toxic or poisonous. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question, Allegra. They are threatened, yes. I just don't know to what level they are. Um, let's see. All right. So to wrap it up here, well, I don't want you guys to think that invasive species are bad. They're not bad. No plant is evil or bad. They just, um, they were brought here probably by us, by humans, um, either because we thought they were pretty or because it accidentally, the seed was stuck to our boot as we traveled the Atlantic and, uh, and it came here. Um, so they're not bad. They're just growing where they popped up. But, um, in efforts to um, to help the species, the native species that are here, it's be more beneficial for us to grow the native species. Um, if you have a plant that you like that's non-native, it's fine. It's pretty. It's nice. But just make sure that you have some native plants too to help them out, and make sure that the native plants are not being outcompeted because the non-native plants don't have as many predators and limitations, and so they can grow without more limitations. So we have to take on that role. Um, so I'm going to leave, um, after this is done, I'll leave in the description the link for a website where you can find um, native plants that you can grow in your yard. Um, I, f I, did, I forgot to add it on before this. So uh, just look out for that. 
but one is milkweed. There's also sunflowers. I mentioned goldenrod earlier and um, bee balm. Has bees in the name. Can't mess it up. Um, so any of those plants would be awesome for you to grow. Um, yeah. So I'm going to wrap this up as I always do with going to check for eggs in the chicken coop. Sound good? Let me put on my jacket because I'm about to go outside again. If anybody has any questions, put them in the comments. And we'll go from there. Speaking of um, plants growing where you don't want them to, all these purple flowers here are called purple dead nettle. Purple dead nettle, which I think is such an unfortunate name. But they're actually nice. They, um, they're in the mint family, so they taste like mint if you eat them. And they have uh, anti-inflammatory, anti antiseptic properties, all that kind of stuff. So uh, if you get cut, you can crush it up and kind of rub it on the wound and it helps it prevent it from getting infected. Michelle, we're getting chickens soon and need advice as a first time owner. Oh gosh, Michelle. Uh, go back to, uh, to my video from two weeks ago and it's almost a half hour video of uh, chicken care. Um, or you can send a, a message to the Woodcock uh, Facebook and I can talk to you more about that there. Um, but yeah, chickens are awesome. I love them. We can say hi to them really quick. They're all hiding underneath the holly bush. Hello. They're very nice. The things with chickens is that you just need to make sure that they have like an enclosed area, a coop, um, and also it's nice to have a place for them to run. All right, let's check for eggs and then we can wrap up here. <gasps> Eliza, I'm sorry to disrupt you but I'll take this other egg while I'm here. Okay, Eliza, you keep on doing what you're doing. All right, here's our egg. This one I believe is from Littlefoot, which is our silver-laced Wyandotte. I'm gonna check our other spot because they like to lay in two spots. They lay in our mini coop as well, our mini cooper. Let's see, anybody see any back there? It would be in the corner. No, it's looking like not. <sighs> Nikki and Lindsay, hey, uh, we're getting a dog. Do you have one? And if you do, can you show us him or her? I do not have a dog, unfortunately. Um, I used to have a dog and she lived to a ripe old age, um, but she's no longer with us. But in my house at this moment, I do have four cats. My mom has three, and then my cat is up here with me as well. Um, yeah. I do have cats. Uh, perhaps I can show them to you another time. Or I can show you a picture. Um, but yeah, that's exciting to get a dog. I would love to get a dog, but I live in a little apartment, and a dog wouldn't work. So. All right, any last-minute questions before I wrap this up? So in the meantime, um, I wanna thank everybody who's donated to Woodcock Nature Center um, in the past few weeks. Those donations are very appreciated. Um, we can't thank you enough. It really helps us out. Um, stay tuned this week for all Earth Day events and things. We have Jen's Cabinet from Curiosities video from yesterday. Um, that should be back in our logs from, from yesterday's Facebook posts. Um, later today, we have a, uh, a bio blitz, and uh, there's a how to use iNaturalist video up on YouTube, which is very good. Um, it'll help you. Um, it's a software or an app that helps you to identify species. Um, Sarah has an, uh, an upcycling craft video coming up on Friday. And then tomorrow, Thursday, there is um, Allegra's humans Im Human Impact on Wildlife. So... All right, thank you everyone for tuning in, and I will see you all next week. Happy Earth Day! Woo!